Welcome to the seventh episode of Abbott and Credlin, a podcast where we explore the foundations, recent fortunes and future of politics at home and abroad. In this series, we're going to unpack not just what's happening, but how and why. Political history and philosophy, as well as the mechanics of politics, the behind the scenes stuff that as a former Prime Minister and a PM's Chief of Staff, we both know all too well. If you want to delve more deeply into the strengths and weaknesses of public life today, well, this podcast is meant for you. My name is Peter Credlin, and I'm joined now by former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Nice to be here, Peter. It's opportune that we're talking so close today after Saturday's referendum on The Voice because there's a lot to talk about as we all sort of analyse the result. You know, the first referendum or the only referendum this century, an enormous question, a difficult question, like a sensitive question for Australians, perhaps a question that they didn't need to answer, but the Prime Minister certainly forced them to the ballot box. The polls were very much the yes cases way in the early days. But as more and more of the debate went on, Tony, the polls went absolutely south for the government. There was a lot of money for the yes case, a lot of moral pressure piled on Australians. But I don't think the result could have been any more emphatic against this proposal. This was one of the most decisive results of any referendum it was one of the heaviest defeats that any referendum proposal has ever suffered. Uh, I just hope that the government is listening. That's the big issue for me in the week after the referendum. Is the government really listening to the result, which was absolutely emphatic? It's just to, to put it into context too, the 1999 referendum put up by John Howard to have a preamble that, amongst other things, mentioned Aboriginal people. That looks like it got more of a vote, you know, 39, close to 40% than this one. And I think even the Republic referendum did better. Absolutely. Look, the Republican referendum was heavily defeated, 55 to 45, notwithstanding an absolute weight of elite opinion for a Republic. This one despite even more elite opinion, Mm -hmm. despite an even more one-sided barrage of money and moral pressure, was even more heavily defeated. It was a 60 plus to 40 minus defeat for The Voice, which uh, was by an order of magnitude greater Mm. than the defeat that the Republican referendum suffered uh, back in 1999. So so why? Let's get into why, because, you know, The Prime Minister told us it was just an advisory body, it was just being polite to Aboriginal people. That's not right, though. Well, that's right. See, there was always a contradiction at the heart of the Prime Minister's pitch. On the one hand, he said it was just being polite. He said it was just an advisory body. I think by the end, he was saying it was just an advisory committee, as if advisory committees get entrenched into the Constitution. But on the other hand, he was also saying that this was going to be an epoch-changing improvement to the way Aboriginal people lived. It was going to basically set the seal on the whole reconciliation process. It was going to be both historic and insignificant at the same time. And it can't be. I mean, that that's... can't be. So that, that, was, the, that was the problem uh, with the Prime Minister's pitch. And then as the debate went on, there was this dawning realisation that it was going to entrench two different categories of Australians into the Constitution on the basis of ancestry. Plus, it was going to gum up our government. Plus, it was going to enshrine separatism. So notwithstanding all the superficial elite endorsements, notwithstanding big business, big sport, big tech, even some of the church groups coming out in favour of it, it was always a very bad idea. Mm. And so in the end, it was a big no to the voice, but it was also a really big yes to equality and to unity. So I think it's a result that the Australian people can take a great deal of quiet pride in, but it's also a result that both sides of politics 
need to learn from. And you say pride because you're saying that um, in voting no, Australians voted yes to a colourblind constitution because there was a real sense immediately after the vote that we were supposed to be mourning. I mean, mm-hmm. the Aboriginal leaders are certainly mm-hmm. mourning this mm-hmm. week. The flags are half mast and they're not talking to the media. We were supposed to be almost a bit ashamed at the result. But, but you know, the Australian public always get it right. And I think the Australian public voted for as much of a yes case to keeping this country united as it was to any sense of, of negative no. Well, well, this is exactly right. Uh, you've got to accept the result uh, if you believe in democracy. Uh, you might not like it, but you've got to live with it if you're a genuine Democrat. Has the government accepted it, though? It doesn't seem like they have. Well, this is the big question. In Parliament this week so far, the Prime Minister seems to say, yes, I accept the result, but I'm just as committed to treaty and truth as I ever was because that was the commitment that I have given to Aboriginal people. That was the commitment that I made to the Australian public. And yet, given that voice, treaty and truth were a package deal, Mm. they were the Uluru agenda. By voting such a resounding no to the voice, I think it would be an impertinence of the government to say, well, we can't do the voice because you told us no, but by gee, we're certainly going to crack on with treaty and truth. You don't don't get a trifecta if you lose the first leg, do you? Exactly right. That's extremely well put. So I think the Prime Minister, not to put too fine a point on it, he really does need to wake up to himself on this uh, because uh, while I think he and his supporters are still, in a sense, in shock over this result. Mm. They need, they do need to appreciate, really, in the marrow of their bones, as Democrats, that no means no. Mm. Uh, and no to a voice means no to the rest of the Uluru agenda as well, which is treaty and truth. And let's face it, voice, treaty and truth were a package deal to entrench separatism in the end, what the public were voting against was separatism. Mm. And we can't have separatism via the back door through treaty and so-called truth, having rejected it in the front door by saying no to the voice. I want to pull apart this this whole Makarata Commission Mm -hmm. treaty issue in a moment, Mm -hmm. because it was a feature of the voice campaign, denied, of course, by anyone on the Yes Camp side, but very clear, as we've seen this week, absolutely part of the government's agenda. But one thing staggers me, given how, yes, the initial polls were going the way of the voice, you know, enormous goodwill from Australians towards Aboriginal people, but as the detail became apparent with the government's voice plan, that support fell away. Pretty much from about the middle of the year, the polls were tracking very much against the voice. Mm -hmm. Yet the Prime Minister didn't seem to do anything to address legitimate concerns Australians had. He thumbed his nose at the opposition. He didn't respond to questions. There was no uh, constitutional convention, concerns of jurists, even people that were supporters of the voice but had legal, structural, administrative law concerns were ignored. Why didn't they change tack, Tony. Why didn't they, you know, you do this in an election campaign to salvage your policy, you listen as you go, you, you perhaps moderate policy or, you know, address concerns, but we saw none of that. Look, it's a very good question and it's perhaps hard for me to put myself into the mind of Anthony Albanese because he's a Prime Minister who comes at things from a different a philosophical perspective than I do. My sense of it, trying to look sympathetically at him in his position, is first that he felt very much indebted uh, to the Aboriginal leaders who had put the voice proposal together, the Noel Pearsons and Mm. the Marshall Langtons and the Megan Davises of this world. Mm. I think he felt very committed to doing what they wanted. We saw that earlier in the year when even the... uh, government's attorney general wanted to change the proposal and take away the to the executive government aspect and 
he apparently, so it was reported, went to the Prime Minister with this recommendation and the recommendation, Prime Minister point blank refused. So I think that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, I think perhaps he was haunted by the Kevin Rudd experience. You might remember mm, back in February of yes. 2010, yes. having said that climate change was the great economic political and even moral challenge of our time and that the way to deal with it was to have an emissions trading scheme, mm. Kevin Rudd pulled his scheme. Now, this is thought to have fatally damaged the Kevin Rudd prime ministership and given everything that Anthony Albanese had invested in The Voice, I think he may well have felt that pulling it or substantially altering it mm. would have as it were, knock the stuffing out of his prime ministership. That said, I think to lose a referendum like this on such a topic as this has done enormous damage to the prime minister's okay. moral authority and he'll struggle to get it back. I think there's something in his complete capitulation to the Aboriginal elite mm. on that side of the referendum, i.e. before the result comes in on Saturday night. Mm. But given the result, given how emphatic it was, given that there was not even a state that went his way, the Northern Territory mm. didn't even go his way. Mm. And we find that there are uh, big communities uh, where there is a strong Aboriginal population and those electorates, those communities and polling booths did not go the way of the voice. Given that, surely on the other side, this apparent commitment to you know the other two legs of the trifecta, voice, treaty, truth. Well, now it's treaty and truth on the table. Given we know that they don't speak the Noel Pearsons, Marsha Langtons, Megan Davis for all Aboriginal people, and given in the campaign we saw just the barnstorming of the country by Warren Mundine and Jacinta Price and Karen Little, other strong Aboriginal voices who completely disagreed mm -hmm. with the separatism of the old way, they called it. Surely the Prime Minister now has to, A, listen to non-Indigenous Australians and how they voted, but also that growing group of other Aboriginal leaders out there who say, we don't want separatism, we don't want to be different, we do want change. Hmm. And this idea from the PM that if you don't have the voice, nothing will change, you're voting for the status quo, that has to be rejected as well. Well, that's exactly right, because... Uh Warren Mundine and Jacinda Price and Karen Little certainly weren't saying, yes, we support the status quo. They were saying that the status quo was indeed uh, utterly unacceptable, mm. um, but they were making the point that the status quo was really the result of governments po following for the last 30 years the advice of people like Marsha Langton, Megan Davis and Noel Pearson, the self-determination stroke separatist agenda, which had led to these remote communities being treated almost like anthropological experiments where Aboriginal people were expected to live a different and separate life mm. to the lives of the rest of the Australian community. And the Mundine Price line is, look, the way to get ahead is not to see yourself as an Aboriginal people who has to, as an Aboriginal person who has to live differently, but to, to paraphrase Warren, as with everyone else, you go to school, you get a job. If you can, you start a business. If you can, you buy a house. If you can, you have a family. And then this whole virtuous circle and cycle of civic engagement starts again. And that was the story of his family, even though in the early days, they certainly labored under the various disabilities of the protection regime that mm. existed up until the 1960s. But nevertheless, his family history and that really of, uh, of, of Jacinda Price's family as well is of trying to make the most of your opportunities, trying to get ahead in the modern Australian world, while at the same time appreciating, respecting and preserving the Indigenous heritage that you've got. I think just into two, you know, part of part of her plea is that we just don't give up on Aboriginal mm. kids, in particular. You know that we don't we don't accept things happening to Aboriginal kids that we wouldn't accept to kids ha in the suburbs of Sydney or mm -hmm. Melbourne. And you know, you you are always going to get shocking educational outcomes if you don't go to school. You're always going to have less money to pay for the things you need in life if you don't earn an income. And you're right, 
there's almost a sense with some of the activist class that they don't necessarily want some of these gaps mm-hmm. closed mm-hmm. because having remote communities in misery and dysfunction is a stick to beat the government with, whatever that government of the day might be. It keeps the millions and billions of dollars flowing into the Aboriginal economy. Mm. And there are in these communities, as you know well, Tony, some big men, and they are mainly men, who tend to do quite well financially. Mm. And so out of this debate, I think Australians have a better understanding of, of how big the gap is what sort of things are part of the gap, education, advantage, um, living a life without sexual or domestic violence, all of those things. Mm -hmm. But also that we spend billions and billions and billions of dollars. There's no shortage of money. There's a lot of goodwill from Australians. But somewhere between Canberra, when the money leaves, Mm -hmm. and the communities where it doesn't arrive, something crook's going on. Yeah, look, given the self-determination stroke separatist mindset, which has governed Indigenous policy for decades now, I think a a lot of the money, and yes, we have to separate it into the different categories of Indigenous-specific spending and spending on Aboriginal people through mainstream programs, but Mm. a lot of the Indigenous-specific money has serviced the problem rather than solved the problem. And this is a terrible difficulty and it's inherent in any government program. If you set up a a government program to end discrimination and discrimination ends, well, then the administrators of the program are out of a job. Yeah, yeah, public servants don't really like to solve a problem. No, no. I mean, the problem needs to be serviced rather than solved. And there's a sense in which once we decreed that Aboriginal disadvantage was a problem that had to be solved and set up a specific system to deal with it, we were probably always going to have this further difficulty of the system not wanting to succeed so much that the system became redundant. So if, for argument's sake, Aboriginal people did get the good primary education in the remote areas that they should, and if they did then get the good secondary education, probably at boarding schools in major centres, Mm. that they should. And if they did then move into the wider economy in major centres as they might, in the same way that people growing up in towns of Victoria or New South Wales, if all of that were to happen over time, there wouldn't be the problem of disadvantage. There wouldn't be the problem of dysfunction other than to the extent that it exists in the general community. Yeah, but hang on, Tony, but then you risk, and this is the, mm. the issue that happens in a lot of country towns with non-Indigenous kids, you risk those those remote communities not existing anymore because if the kids get an education, they go to town, mm. they build a life, uh, they uh, become a bit more mainstream in the broader Australian community, they might want to go and live in Yendamu or the middle of nowhere and I think that's part of the problem. And these these communities can't be museums kept in perpetuity just to make activists in Sydney and Melbourne look and sound good on Q&A and drag in the billions from Canberra. These are real people that deserve a crack at life and they don't get it because in part <laughs> the system sort of works against of them course. succeeding. But m- most of these remote communities were originally – mission stations. Mm-hmm. They're originally feeding points effectively that that the clans would come into when the seasons were poor for help. And the missions would be there to offer help and mm. then perhaps to do what they could to preach the gospel and so on. So I absolutely accept uh, that Aboriginal people have a strong sense of country. Mm-hmm. And I absolutely accept that a very important element in Indigenous spirituality is the land. Mm -hmm. Um, I think all of us can feel some sense of that, Uh, but certainly it's very strong with Aboriginal people. But as Noel Pearson used to say in the days when he and I were working closely together in Cape York, connectedness to country does not mean that you have to live in a particular spot all your life. Mm -hmm. It just means 
uh, that your connectedness to that that area uh, gives you a degree of nourishment wherever you are. And I think this is this is part of the problem, as you say, that that people are expected to stay in places with no economic base. And as we know, uh, communities with no economic base mm. are inevitably communities where most of the adults don't have anything much to do and that leads to all sorts of difficulties. So this is now the new fight for Price and Mundine and others and, 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 and the broader coalition because they, they, they want an audit. Mm. Just into Price and the coalition are calling for a Royal Commission into child sexual mm-hmm. abuse in Aboriginal communities. And they want the debate to be about practical outcomes, not not empty symbolism, and they regard the voices as being dangerous on one side, entrenching race in the constitution, but also not not being about the people on the ground. It's it's more about, you know, all the power structures we've talked about. What does this mean politically for the Prime Minister? Because you know, in that vote on Saturday night it was 40% plus of Labor supporters. So 40% of his own side walked. They didn't buy his mm-hmm. voice. They didn't buy his advocacy. We know that when he was elected Prime Minister, he only won 30% of the vote of Australians. I know it feels more comprehensive than that because he's had some, you know, significant um, honeymoon months, if I can call it that. And of course, you know, he was aided very much into the lodge by the unpopularity of, of Scott Morrison. But this is a big hit. And particularly if he keeps pushing treaty, given how much treaty became an issue in the voice, and it was rejected very much on Saturday night, along with the voice. What happens here now for the Prime Minister? He's in dangerous territory, I reckon. This is a very important question, and let's get to it in a second. But before we move off Indigenous policy, can I just say this, Peter? I thought one of the key moments of the campaign proper mm. was when Jacinda Price was at the National mm. Press Club and she was asked about the ongoing effect of colonisation and she really hit it out of the park. She said, look, uh, some of my ancestors were convicts. Uh, does that make me traumatised? As well as some of my ancestors being Indigenous. The idea that colonisation is is to blame for our problems is just completely wrong. The explanation for our problems is uh, the fact that uh, we don't go to school, we don't get jobs, we don't have our communities policed and safe. That's the explanation for our problems. So, so I think it's, I think we really do have to move past this neo-Marxist interpretation which says that Aboriginal people are always going to be victims because of what happened in 1788 and subsequently. I mean, this idea that my life is blighted because some of my ancestors might have been discriminated against 100, 150, 200 years ago is just wrong, and we've just got to put that behind us in a policy sense. And wonderful work by Jacinda at the National Press Club there. But to get on to the politics of the issue, as you say, this vote, perhaps even more so than the same-sex marriage vote, and perhaps even more so than the Republican vote a quarter century back, illustrated a big divide in Australian politics. It's not an economic divide so much as a culture divide, although there's an economic dimension to it. Mm. The rich, woke suburbs all voted yes, and the less rich practical suburbs or and, and towns all voted no. As someone put it, the places with real problems voted no. The places with first world problems voted yes. And uh, many, many of the places overwhelmingly voting no, uh, the western suburbs of Sydney, for instance, the outer metropolitan areas of Melbourne, are normally strong Labor seats. Mm. so Some of their strongest, you know, 25% margins. So, so there's a lesson here for the Labor Party. Don't get too woke because you'll lose your working class supporters. Mm. But likewise, there's a lesson here for the Liberal Party. Don't be too eager to win back the teal seats uh, by going woke yourself because 
your cruel your pitch in the aspirational seats. So this was where I think Peter Dutton was both brave and ultimately politically sensible by relatively early in this debate coming out against the voice because he did the right thing, I believe, by liberal conservative thinking to oppose this thing that was going to contradict the great principle of equality and also uh, make the practicalities of our government so much more difficult. So he did the right thing, but it turned out to be the politically shrewd thing as well Mm. because he, in the end, turned out to be much more in touch with the overwhelming majority of Australians than the Prime Minister did. So, So there are lessons here for both sides of politics. The question is, will Labor sufficiently overcome its current green left obsessions to learn? And will the coalition realise that fighting on some issues rather than simply going with the zeitgeist can often be to its great political benefit? I think we we said it in a podcast we did here on The Voice, but I know I've certainly said it on my program and written it in columns that I felt the voice vote would be absolutely about the voice and Mm. and equality in our constitution, the things we talked about, the substance of the question. But it would also be a rare chance for ordinary Australians to have their say and all the other things that happen by stealth where they don't get a say. Mm. You know, all the the counselling of women, for Mm. example, the general sort of woke push in the curriculum, Mm. things where it's done in their name but not with their consent. And I think wrapped up in all of this was a great thumbing of the nose by voters to the elites because at a time when they are really doing it tough, they want to see government focused on them and, and you know, whether they like this idea or not, many think thought it was a distraction. I guess I'd say it's more than just working class seats. I know you, you mentioned aspiration, but if you look at the numbers, it literally is a handful of seats mm. that voted yes. Very, very inner city parts of our capital cities. And those where wealth is on a scale that most Australians can't even fathom. Yeah. Now, the challenge for Labor is to take the result on the chin, mm. government to be humbled by the result and to change course. Mm-hmm. And to say to these Aboriginal leaders... I think many who now need to exit the stage and pass to a younger generation, that the old black armband of history, activist agenda has got to go. Australians now have rejected that. They rejected it in 99 and they've rejected it again. And our our way forward has got to be far more conciliatory and focused on practical solutions Mm. and not power structures and symbolism. But also on the other side, to the Liberal Party, One, pick a few fights Mm -hmm. on matters Mm -hmm. of conviction. Mm -hmm. You might surprise yourself and win them. Mm -hmm. Don't just be a paler version of Labor. But two, given the way the party structure, the Liberal Party structures work, there's an inordinate influence both of uh, party officials and and donors and others from those now teal seats. And they have a big voice inside the party you know, what are we going to do to win Kuyong back? How are we going to get North Sydney back? And fair enough, contest those seats as we should and try and win them. But if the Liberal Party tries to reshape its policy just to appease, mm. appease and appeal to the concerns of those seats, it misses out on great parts of the country that actually help it to form government. And this will be, the, I guess, the, the period of time ahead between now and the next election when they work on policy, where Peter Dutton will need a bit of steel in his spine to trust his judgment as he trusted it on this issue, because not everyone agreed with him when he went down this path, trust his judgment and know that if he stands with ordinary Australians, he's going to get the balance right. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, look, (laughs) the essential elements uh, for political success, I believe, are... uh, uh, courage, conviction, and character, and in this instance, uh, Peter Dutton has shown all three. Mm. Uh, he's shown a good political character. Uh, he's shown a strong political conviction, 
and he's shown a degree of courage in coming to a decision arguing what was initially an unpopular case into a position of political success. So so all credit to him. And the fact that he's managed to do so well on a topic where so much uh, was apparently going against him, uh, the weight of elite opinion, big business, big sport, big tech, etc., should give him heart mm. on a whole lot of other issues uh, like energy policy, for instance, uh, like identity politics more generally, on things like reform of education to get it back to basics. Uh, I, th- I think there is a lot of encouragement for Peter Dutton here, but but we do need to appreciate that while this is a seismic result, mm. there are lots and lots and lots of other issues on which people absolutely still have to uh, to be persuaded. You know, I've still got to be in my bonnet because um, the Prime Minister in the Parliament basically inferred I was some sort of conspiracy theorist because I argued that the Uluru Statement was 26 pages, that it was a radical manifesto, uh, that it included not just the voice but a Makarata Treaty mm-hmm. Commission mm-hmm. and, and truth-telling, which is just revisionism of our history as a story mm-hmm. of shame. And he said, no, 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 it's a one-page poster basically. And it's interesting. He said it was a it was a conspiracy worthy of Q and on. I think yeah. uh, it's interesting though. On the other side of this vote, with the voice defeated, he has been pursued in the parliament about this treaty, a treaty that he said was nothing to do with Saturday's result last week, and this week he's saying the treaty is so important, Macarat is so important. We have to keep spending money on it. We have to keep spending millions on it. Yeah. So, this is, for me, the new fight uh, to make sure that he has no license whatsoever to pursue a treaty given the result of, uh, about the voice. How do you think the treaty debate goes from here? Because because Macarada is in the budget, Macarada, he will soon start appointing or, or thinks he's going to start appointing mm. a majority Indigenous commission and we're going to go down the path of trying to make a treaty with ourselves when Australians don't want a bar of it. I think he will find uh, a lot of people inside his own green left political party uh, who will urge him to push on. On the other hand, I think if he does push on and if he is vigorously opposed by mm-hmm. the coalition, uh, he's in a world of political hurt. And Dutton should take this to an election if it comes to this. If it comes to it, certainly. Uh, But look, I I really think when we look back on this, the two campaigns have been almost a textbook case of how on the no side to run a good campaign and how on the yes side to blow an enormous amount of political goodwill. I mean, if you look at the the yes case, the Prime Minister was never on top of the detail. Mm. As soon as things got difficult... Uh, leading yes advocates such as Noel Pearson and Marsha Langton got extremely nasty towards uh, even people on their own side uh, who were suggesting slight differences uh, of, of approach. And started attacking the voter. Are crazy. Exactly right. I mean, in the end, uh, the voter is always right. You can never attack the voter. Uh, on, the other, on the other side, after a very slow start, the No campaign uh, was unified with Advance Australia, Stroke Fair Australia, uh, providing the campaign logistics. Mm. You had in Jacinda Price and Warren Mundine uh, two very effective, very simpatico, very together main spokespeople. And of course, uh, uh, Peter Dutton's courageous decision uh, to come out very clearly on one side of this argument, despite the difficulties uh, that he had initially with some of his own front bench. So this has really been a textbook case in how to run or not run a campaign. And in the end, I think it's been something that uh, has been very good for the Australian people because we've reasserted our faith in ourselves and our belief in our country. It really was, I think, our Brexit moment Mm. and 
the challenge is, Tony Abbott, not to waste it. Exactly right. Thank you. Thanks, Peter.